First, I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation and I uh, hope the audience will find the topic I'm going to present also quite interesting, as interesting as I found this topic for many decades in the end. What I, I'm going to try in this talk is I try to join two groups of fish which are not very much related to each other, sturgeon on the one hand and uh, freshwater fish, tilios on the other hand, but they are joined together by one, one aspect, which is cyclical reproduction. And so I try to give you two aspects of this kind of cyclical reproduction in these two different groups of um, fishes. If we go, for example, into a tropical country like the Chad, and these are data from French scientists, who looked at the reproductive activity of uh, fishes in the Chad, you will find that there are fish which, are, which I would call fish without characterized by cyclical reproduction because they are reproducing only for a very short period of time over the whole year for two or three months, whereas others, for example, cichlids, if you look at the reproductive activity, they practically over the whole year they reproduce. So these fish are called while they are reproducing continuously. But those which uh, have cyclic reproduction, apparently their reproduction is related, if you look at the precipitation, rainfall, apparently their reproduction is somehow related to the occurrence of the rainy season and not of the dry season. And so when we started to work on that, our point was if you do a uh, working hypothesis, what factors might be important for as environmental factors which uh, provoke this kind of cyclical reproduction in the fish. And uh, if you look into tropical habitats, water level increase is a very important environmental uh, factor which may change between dry and rainy season. Conductivity decrease, so the iron content of the water and uh, maybe a rain, there are some data on fish that they are uh, hearing rain and that they may re respond to that with reproductive activity and looked as if there were also some kind of pH decrease occurring during uh, the rainy season. So these were the idea, maybe these factors have an impact on these tropical fish and so we did what I'm going to present our experimental studies in our uh, on this topic. And uh, I've mainly started with a knife fish, which is the advantage of this fish was that it was transparent. And if you do not have very many fish and if you want to work on uh, gonad development, uh, then it is important to be able to work with a few fish. And this fish is quite transparent, and the advantage of it is that you could have a look into the body cavity of the fish and see if during the experiment there was some kind of change, increase in the ovaries and the testes of this fish. So that was the, the, the reason for uh, choosing this fish in the beginning. And here you uh, will find the critical, what I call critical experiment, which we did with these knife fish. So we... Um, started after a few months with decreasing the conductivity, uh, decreasing the pH and increasing the water level and also did imitation of rain. And at the beginning this fish had regressed gonads that was easily be seen because they were transparent. And then after about uh, three, four weeks these fish had developed apparently mature gonads you could see eggs in the body cavity of the females, but the fish didn't spawn. And then after some weeks, we uh, changed the uh, environmental factors back. We increased conductivity, had pH constant and the water level constant as well. And then we tried to do the same experiment after some weeks again. And in the course of this uh, conductivity increase, the fish uh, showed regression of gonads. So at the end of this P 
period, they had again regressed gonads. And so we started a second time an experiment tried to decrease conductivity, pH, and um, increase water level. And the fish again reacted, but again they didn't spawn. We tried a lot of different habit, um, um, substrates, plants, different plants, gravel, and a lot of other things, but there was no spawning in these fish. And I show you here a table where, with these fish which were imported from South America, we did 10 breeding experiments. And if you look at the right column, you see that only in three cases, very rare spawning activities were, were occurred. In one experiment, one spawning, another one, three, and another one, two spawnings. And luckily, in these few spawnings, we got some fish and we raised these fish. And then we did with these F1, F2, F3 fish, that's the lower part of the table, we did the same kind of breeding experiments with the same substrates. And if you look on the right column, you see in, any, in every experiment where we did this breeding, the fish spawned. And uh, though the aquarium in which we kept the fish were the same, they spawned in floating plants, it was very easy to raise the fish then, and we still do not understand very well why these fish, which were imported from South America, did not spawn so regularly, only very rarely, whereas these fish, which we raised in, in the aquarium, they spawned then without any problem. And to give you an idea about such um, F1 breeding experiment with Eigenmania, there were two females and three males in this tank, and you can see that female number two, for example, spawned 30 times over the whole length of this reproductive uh, reproduction experiment, female one 28 times. So these fish really can be called fractional or batch spawners. So they spawn and then there's an interval. They do not spawn, they spawn again and spawn again and <coughs> spawn again. But spawning activity, the reproductive period here, was ended because the increase of conductivity occurred at the end of experiment. So if you look at um, reproductive strategies in teleosts, we have the one hand single spawners like eel and salmon. We have repeated spawners. And in this group, we have total spawners, so fish once they are mature, spawn all the eggs in a very short period of time, and others which are the batch spawners. And in the batch spawners, we have determinate batch spawners and indeterminate batch spawners. Determinate batch spawners means that fish can only spawn in the, during the reproductive period during certain times. For example, the European barb, there are experimental studies which have shown they can only spawn in one reproductive period eight times, and then they stop. It is somehow the internal milieu, the physiology of fish, which stops them from, from spawning. But if you look at these eigenmania, these tropical fish, it was just the environmental factors which stopped spawning activity. So these fish then could be called indeterminate batch spawners because it's just the environment factors which determine when they uh, stop spawning and the reproductive period can be extremely long. And if you look at the gonads uh, during these experiments, um, in the beginning they had regressed gonads where there are different um, terminologies as far as, for example, uh, oogenesis is concerned. I have taken here four stages in, our, um, in oocyte development. And so during the experiment, the fish start from regressed gonads, oocytes one, and then they pass through oocytes two, um, yolk vesicle formation, oocytes three, um, when um, uh, yolk is developed in the egg. So that is a process which takes time that explains why the experiments have to be done for at least a few weeks till the fish reef but they have acquired maturity and are able to spawn the same at the level of the males. In the beginning, they're only spermatogonia. And then in the mature testis, you have all the different stages of spermatocytes, from spermatocytes one and two, sperm and um, spermatids. 
So also in the males, it takes some time to become mature. So these experiments have to be done in the beginning, at least for two, three, four, five weeks. And uh, well, the, we then switched um, to African fishes, the momarid fishes. And I'll show you here an experiment where three times with this species, we induced gonad maturation and then induced gonad regression. And the second time, gonad development and again, gonad regression. And the third time, gonad development again. And we did that with other uh, species as well. And this experiment gives an idea that uh, these fish represent a very dynamic system. It's just the environmental factors which tell the fish, now you should start with the gonad development and then gonad regression is induced and gonad maturation again. And it's just the environmental factors and that apparently is a very good <coughs> adaptation to the natural environment where the rainy season uh, may occur for a short period of time or a longer period of time. There are even habitats in Africa, for example, where there are two rainy and two dry seasons and there it has been shown that these fish also spawn there twice a year. So this apparently is a very dynamic system which we have in these uh, tropical fishes. And I'll show you a last experiment with another momarid fish. Um, <clears throat> because we asked the question, well, if there are four factors which uh, are responsible for the gonad development, which of these four factors are really important? Can we leave out some of them? And here, number one means we only change the conductivity uh, in this experiment. And the fish reacted. There was a reproductive period of weeks and then we increased conductivity and gonad regression was induced again. Only by changing conductivity and the second time we only uh, decreased uh, conductivity and the fish reacted again. Uh, then we increased conductivity so the fish at the beginning of the experiment had regressed gonads again. But then we kept conductivity constant, experiment number three, and we varied water level and we imitated rain and the fish did not react, react at all to these factors. And then afterwards, we decreased conductivity again, and again the fish reacted to, to this conductivity decrease. So in this experiment, I think it was quite clear, clearly shown that these fish only look at the conductivity change and they don't bother about the other factors. And since then, in this momarid fish, we always used this technique. We just kept the water level constant, only changed conductivity, and the fish spawned, uh, uh, developed uh, gonads. And okay, so that was then in the end a quite simple technique to breed uh, momarid fish. Well, you could always argue, well, that is a nice experimental system which you have uh, there developed, but it has nothing to do with the natural environment of the fish. So, um, after our experiments, some uh, two French uh, scientists looked into the chart uh, and in this uh, fish, Polymaris isidori, it, they could show that they have a very pronounced cyclical reproduction. And if they looked at the environmental factors, it could very clearly show that before these fish showed um, uh, reproductive activity, there was an decrease in conductivity in the river where they lived and there was an increase in water level evidently because there was a rainy season. So I think our system which we had studied in the lab was quite a good imitation uh, of the real realistic situation which these fish uh, find in the wild. Um, so that gives it just an overview of the molecular phylogenetics of the momarid fish and that till now we have bred about 14 species of these and we have a quite good overview of the reproductive biology of these different species. And while well, the 14th species we managed to reproduce it via artificial reproduction because now we are able also to manipulate uh, uh, environmental, uh, manipulate uh, these fish via hormone injections, so we also can 
uh, reproduce fish which are difficult to breed. For example, this last species, Chokwe, uh, was very difficult. We imported these fish in 2012 from Africa and put it into our lab. There were a male and a female, and these fish were so aggressive that three times the male nearly killed the female, and so we had to separate the fish. And so the only chance to try to reproduce the fish and to get information on the development really was to do artificial reproduction, which in the end uh, we developed and now we uh, are quite well able to, to apply that to this group of fish. Well, the topic in itself I think is quite interesting, cyclical production, but we were interested, I in particular were interested in development of electric organ. Just to give you an idea, we studied the development of electric organ in, in these more married fish and it was quite surprising to find that these fish have a primitive electric organ uh, which we call then larval electric organ and this stays for some time in the early development of the fish and then later on the electric organ, the tail, which was well known, uh, then develops and so there is a, a time where both organs are functionally active and they overlap and then later on the larval organ disappears. So that was a quite interesting, surprising uh, result which we found. And that was only based uh, on the fact that we were able to breed these fish in the lab. And uh, we did a, a similar comparative study on uh, the knife fishes, South American knife fish, that gives an overview of the different species which we also bred uh, in the course of the well, decades and um, I will give you only one uh, aspect of development uh, of um, knife fishes, which is quite interesting also if you look at the evolution of electric organs. The Apteronotid family is one family of the knife fishes which is characterized by the fact that the electric organ is composed exclusively of modified nerves. So we looked at the development of this species and we found that very early during development uh, the nine-day-old fish, for example, does not yet have a neurogenic organ, but it has another second type of organ which we could prove is a myogenic organ which is derived from muscle tissue. And then a little bit later this fish has both functional organs, a neurogenic organ and a myogenic organ, and later on the myogenic organ disappears and only the um, organ which is derived from nerve cells um, is found in the adult fish. So that if you look at the evolution of the electric organ in this fish, it is an indication that also this fish, apparently in the beginning, had an organ which was derived from muscle and not from nerve tissue. Okay, then um, we asked the question, okay, gymotiform fish occurring in South America, marmarite fish in Africa, may there be other fish which are also characterized by cyclical reproduction uh, for example, Southeast Asia or other African fish, and I will just uh, show two examples um, of this more uh, comparative study which we did. And one is a fish from Southeast Asia. I think aquarists may well know this fish, uh, the uh, Cryptopterus pizzeris. And uh, we uh, changed three factors in the same way as we did before, connectivity decrease, water level increase, and imitation of rain. And we could show that we could elicit also in this catfish uh, gonad uh, development. Males and females look a little bit different at the level of the body cavity. And here you can see there are four female, uh, three females, and um, that in the end, the, the females get really very fat when they have developed. Uh, ovaries. Whereas in this species we only looked at um, uh, gonad histology and gonad weight and we did not try to breed this fish. It was just an attempt to find out if these factors really can elicit also uh, gonad development and if this fish is characterized by cyclical reproduction. And uh, we did the same with an African fish, an African catfish uh, 
uh, Eutropius buffet, there we also could show that these fish react to these factors. If you look at the female on the right side, really it looks as if it is ill, but it's really so full of eggs, and um, so these fish also uh, reacted to these factors. What is quite important, quite interesting, is we analyze the different uh, three factors also, if they all were necessary for the development of the gonads. And what was very surprising is that in this catfish, they apparently only looked at the uh, acoustic signal. They did not bother about the conductivity changes. So uh, apparently in the different groups of fish, they select from these set of environmental factors which change between dry and rainy season, just those factors which uh, apparently are the most uh, useful for their, for their biology, physiology to be selected as indicators when is it rainy and when is dry season. Okay, so that was a short story about cyclical reproduction in tropical fish. And well, now the second part uh, concerns sturgeon. Uh, sturgeon are completely different. Old fish, the oldest sturgeon-like fish occurred about 200 million years ago. And um, actually there are 27 species recognized and uh, 25 species are found in the family Archipensaridae. And the genus Archipensa uh, contains 17 species. And I will give you an example of um, the importance of um, artificial reproduction of this fish in related to um, restoration measures. And I will concentrate on one uh, sturgeon species. Just to remind you that sturgeon are primitive fishes, old fishes, they have a lot of um, characteristics which show they are uh, old fishes and are different from teleos, for example, they still have a very well developed notochord, not very uh, well um, developed differentiated vertebrae around it, they have a spiral valve for the increase of the uh, surface in the, in the intestine, they have, the males have a urogenital system, so the testes are um, related um, to the kidneys and uh, the sperm is transferred through the kidneys and um, then um, released. And that has, for example, um, also consequences for um, uh, artificial reproduction uh, when the sperm is collected. There are characters by ectoreception. I have not shown a picture on that. Uh, they have incomplete ossification. If you look at this picture, red is um, uh, bone and blue is cartilage. They still have, as adult fish, a lot of uh, cartilage. They have a spiracle which allows water to flow um, in, along the gills, not uh, by taking up by the mouth. And they have very pronounced bony plates, big bony plates, but also very small bony um, plates in between these. Uh, big rows. One other aspect of sturgeon is they also are uh, characterized by cyclic reproduction, but the difference to, to teleosts is that not in all species, but in many species, the development of the maturation development, this cycle is longer than one year. In many species, in females, it takes for the whole development, two years in some species, even three years. And then uh, there's a gap, and then after three or four years, the same female will become mature again. So the whole maturation process is a very prolonged um, process, where in males, often it is a one-year cycle. What is known is that the environmental cues which regulate that are mainly temperature, perhaps a little bit of photo period, but the experimental approach and understanding which of these two factors are more important is not uh, very um, well um, studied up to now. Uh, it looks as temperature is the mo most important cues, but even if you keep, that's different to the teleos, if you keep sturgeon at constant environmental factors, constant temperature, constant photo period, there is still a little percentage of fish which uh, mat mature. 
And so that means this uh, cyclic production is controlled by these environment factors, but perhaps not at 100% level. And I uh, will give you some data on uh, the European sturgeon. Uh, this was um, a given overview of the distri original distribution of the fish later. It's a quite large growing fish. Uh, sturgeon are either freshwater fish or fish which after uh, the juvenile stage uh, move into the marine environment and they grow up to quite large size. This species, for example, maximum length was about 4 meter, 400 kilograms, age about 60 years, and the length at first maturity in the males was about 1.2 meters and in females 1.5 meters. The age when they live under natural conditions uh, to reach first maturity is about 12, 15 years. So they must be so old till they first mature for the first time and then can migrate back into the rivers where they were born and spawn and then go back uh, to the marine environment again. And on the right side, one specimen which was uh, caught in the German Eider River. That give um, some ideas about the decline of the populations in Germany here. And you can see that already at the end of the 19th century, there was a decrease in the populations that continues till uh, the beginning of the 20th century then nearly all the fish uh, had disappeared from German waters. There was one example, a small river in the northern part of Germany, the Eider River, where a small population survived till to the 1960s, but because of the weir which was built there, these fish could no longer uh, ascend and reproduce, and then this population also uh, disappeared from German waters. Uh, this European sturgeon originally had a very wide distribution from the Baltic, North Sea, Atlantic, Mediterranean Sea, and um, Black Sea that is widely distributed. Maybe there were different species, but it, there was so little material left that it was difficult to de decide that. The only uh, population which survived was in the Gironde in France. And um, the French group tried to work on the restoration of the species. And here you see from 1981 to 1995 how many mature fish were caught in the Gironde system. So either just one female and two males, or, or a little bit more, but then at the end, from 1990 on, they were able to catch just one male and one female. So that gives an idea about the decline of the population in this river. And uh, because the, these uh, people, these scientists were interested in restoration, they also tried to do artificial reproduction with these fish. In sturgeon, that's a well-established uh, technique, which works, works, works quite well. But over the whole period of time, 15 years, they only managed to do artificial reproduction three times. And only at the end, in 1995, they were able to raise larvae of this um, the species. Before, they had tried to apply the raising technique of Acupensa berry, which they knew very well, and to apply that to this species, and it didn't work. And later on, it also uh, was shown that this species is quite difficult to raise, quite difficult uh, to feed and to grow, and food requirements are very uh, difficult, so it is a very difficult fish uh, to be kept and to raise in captivity. Uh, I'll give you just here a few pictures. It is a, the artificial reproduction is a quite complicated process. You have to do a biopsy to get an information about the development of the um, of the males and the females, and you can also bio, via biopsy uh, take some eggs and try to do that. Um, to, to try to find out if these eggs are um, mature enough that ovulation can be induced uh, very effectively. <clears throat> and once that has been done, then you can uh, collect the sperm and then the eggs can be collected and then they are mixed. So and then uh, they can be um, raised. Uh, so this technique is um, quite well established in, in the sturgeon. 
and the French group uh, then, based on these data which I have just shown, decided to try to, to, to establish a captive breeding group of this species. And so there were t three different uh, group of um, sturgeon which they put together. One, us, one group were old fish which they managed to catch in the Gion system from the 1980s on. And then they also were able to catch a group from 1994 that was the last reproduction in the Gion sy system which occurred where they caught about 40 small fish and transferred them into their uh, facilities and then the 1995 fish uh, which I've just mentioned which uh, were reproduced in 1995 and so they had these three different groups of fish and tried to understand uh, how they have to be uh, kept in captivity and to reproduce them. It did not work with these originally old fish which they had in, the, uh, in their group but um, in the end, um, in Germany, we managed to establish uh, managed to establish a cooperation with a French group, and so we got 40 specimens of this 1995 reproduction, and that was for Germany the start of our restoration project. And since then, we uh, worked uh, on this issue for well up up to now. I will give you some data on that. And com concentrate more on the German side of this. Um, uh, issue. Uh, these two groups, 1994 fish and 1995 fish, then grew up and uh, the French group managed for the first time to do artificial in 2007 with these fish. They were large enough and they had enough fish and uh, from this moment on there was material which was very useful for re restoration, for restocking in the French rivers and also in the German uh, rivers. And uh, we also got uh, some part of these um, fish which were reproduced then from 2007 on. And that gives you an idea about um, our potential brood stock, which is uh, uh, now present in the IGB, in the Institute in Berlin. Uh, from these 40 fish, this first column, there only were only nine fish which survived. We had um, well, technical problems, we had problems with uh, uh, the food, uh, we fed these fish with chironomids, they are very difficult to feed, we were, we were not able to adjust them to dry food, so we had to give them live or frozen food, and apparently uh, with the chironomids we also had pesticides because we lost uh, quite a large number of fish which were really ill and we did analysis and it looked as if it was just uh, the, the food which uh, uh, contained pesticide. From these nine fish, one female in 2005 was mature but we were not able to um, do artificial reproduction, we didn't have a male. Until now we were not yet able to use these few fish for reproduction. And it was only uh, the reproduction in France, which enabled us in Germany to uh, start restocking experiments uh, in Germany. And here you see a picture when in 2008, for the first time, based on this material in the Elbe River, we were able to introduce 40 fish. Uh, these fish were about 30, 40 centimeters large. And uh, so these fish were large enough to uh, be um, equipped with telemetric uh, uh, equipment and so we were able also to follow the migration of the fish when they were released in the Elbe River. And this gives you one example how a fish which was released uh, in the middle part of the Elbe River, um, then what was the migration pattern of this fish. Uh, it's very quickly started to migrate downriver. And then they passed the weir um, in Gestach, there is a big weir, and that was the beginning of the influence, the tidal influence in the Elbe River. And apparently this uh, somehow changed a little behavior because this fish then stayed for some time in one part of the Elbe River, moved a little bit upwards and then moved backwards again. And in the, but in the end, it uh, continued to descend um, this Elbe River till 
uh, they, they reached the ha Hamburg harbor and there, there was no, no possibility to follow this fish again with this telemetric um, methods. The whole distance was about um, 200, 250 kilometers where the fish in very short period of time um, uh, it, it ascended the river because normally at this size these fish uh, stay in the estuary of the river so the fish apparently very quickly tried to uh, find this estuary of the Elbe River. And the main, well, up to now, we mainly uh, use the Elbe River for restoration, for release of fish. There's also the Rhine River, which is, um, was a very important um, river of sturgeon. There are, in the moment, discussions if the Rhine River may be also a very interesting river for restoration, but that in cooperation with uh, uh, the Netherlands, for example, uh, so that will be a quite interesting but quite a uh, complicated issue because the Rhine is also, as far as the ecological situation is concerned, more difficult than the Elbe River. Uh, this gives you an idea uh, how many fish from 2008 on till 2013 were released in the Elbe River or in the smaller tributaries of the Elbe River. So there were 12,000 408 fish released, and from these 5,800 fish were um, equipped with external tags, so that when they were recaptured, that the information uh, could be um, uh, given to the people who did these um, uh, restoration measures. Uh, so that is um, the amount of fish which were released, and um, to give you an idea how many fish survived? Is there information about these fish? And here, from 2007 to 2013, an idea how many f sturgeon were captured. Uh, the number of fish here, number of Acupensasturia, and number of Acupens oxyrhynchus. I didn't talk about oxyrhynchus because that is a fish which uh, is in the moment. Uh, introduced into the Baltic Sea for uh, certain genetic reasons. I don't want to go into detail of that. But there are also, if you look at the left um, column, there are also a lot of other uh, sturgeon species which are not indigenous species. A uh, lot of different species uh, which can be bought in Germany, uh, in the aqua trade, in uh, a lot of other occasions and so a lot of fish which go up and then the people say oh, okay this fish uh, originally was uh, 12 centimeter long but now it is one meter long what sh shall i do with this fish and so these fish uh, then often are released into the rivers and we find a lot of different species in, the, in addition to these uh, acupensa sturio and acupensa oxyrhynchus so this uh, attempt of restoration of this Archipenza Sturia is a very long-lasting project and we are just at the first part and it looks like this is quite uh, successful till now but we have to wait for years and years and uh, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Är det någon som har några frågor? Could you please comment a little bit on the introduction of the North American sturgeon in the Baltic Sea? Yeah, okay. So um, then that was a long story. When we started to, um, well, I did a, this cooperation with France in 1995 and uh, so that was a start for the restoration in Germany and our idea was well when we start to uh, take fish from France what is the genetic basis of these fish so one aspect was we did um, genetic studies on the French uh, population on old um, uh, uh, fish which were caught uh, in the north in the Baltic Sea because the advantage of sturgeon is that the 
bony plates contain DNA. So with, on the based on these bony plates, it was possible to do um, studies on the genetics. And in the Baltic, well, we found that uh, the, the population which was in the Elbe River was identical to the population in the Gironde River. So it was quite useful to use this material for stocking in the North Sea. But then, surprisingly, uh, we found that in the Baltic Sea there were a mixture of Carcupentasturio and Bacchian oxyrhynchus, and apparently in the course of the, um, of the years, of about 2,000 years, there was a dominance of uh, oxyrhynchus over Asturio in the Baltic Sea. There were hybridizations. There was a discussion how much was this hybridization, uh, very strong hybridization, or not, um, but it looks as if there has been some hybridization, but the two species uh, sympathetically uh, survived in, in the Baltic, and that the Oxyrhynchus apparently were more adapted to this kind of environment than the occupant Asturio. And so that was the, the start of the idea, we have to split our um, restoration strategy, Baltic Sea, Occupenza Oxyrhynchus, North Sea, Occupenza Asturio, and so and because Oxyrhynchus was still available in the east coast of um, um, America and Canada, we were able to have material earlier than for Asturio, and so the restoration measures in, in the Baltic Sea with Occupenza Oxyrhynchus started a little bit earlier and were, was more easy than with Asturio, which then in the end uh, came a little bit later after a delay due to this um, lack of reproduction. Uh, of occupants of Sturio. And there are, because we started earlier in the Baltic Sea, now there are fish caught uh, in the Baltic Sea and even a little bit in the northern part of the North Sea of Oxyrhynchus, which are already quite large fish. And, and in addition to that, uh, Pol Poland and other um, countries, uh, Sweden also started to be interested in restoration of occupants of Oxyrhynchus in the, in the Baltic Sea. Thank you. Great with the sturgeon. Fantastic work. Um, how many parents do you use? Or do you only have one male and one female? Or how, how is it? Well, as I uh, tried to explain, in Germany we only have a, a potential breeding group. We were not yet able to reproduce this species. Uh, these first, first 40 fish were reduced to nine fish nowadays, and we did not manage to. The French people had these two main breeding groups, the one which from 1994 and the other from 1995. And when they managed to, for the first time, um, breed the fish from these uh, two sources, they had um, about three, four from each sex. So th the point is, we also looked at the genetics of the different parents. We had a colleague who did that, and so we had a breeding plan. But the reality is that you're lucky that you have a few fish independent of the genetic um, background of these specimens. You have just to, to, be, to, be a, to try to reproduce these fish. And looking at genetics and uh, doing combination of uh, fish, for example, some of the old fish in France which were caught were genetically apparently a little bit diverse, different from uh, the 1994 or 1995 fish. 1994 in the wild, this may have been uh, a reproduction of one male and one female, so also a limited res genetic resource. So, but in the moment, it is just the chance to have some fish independent of and to, to get uh, offspring of these fish. And then in the, I think the next step could be when there are more fish, then, then select this male and this female and try to get a higher diversity of the genetics. Hormones at all to um, for the artificial reproduction uh, to which, induce spawning with the which, sturgeon? No, when uh, I mentioned we had in 2005 once, uh, one female where, where we did regularly these biopsies to get an idea about the development. 
And um, then we found this female already was uh, apparently quite mature, but we looked at the males and the males were not uh, so advanced. And that at the same time we had a um, transfer from an old aquarium hall to a new, uh, so we were not really well equipped. Uh, so we didn't try with this female artificial reproduction. So that would may have been the first chance with these uh, fish, but uh, since then, this in this group we never had at the same time a, a mature ma female and a bit mature male. And um, while I tried to explain these problems with the uh, with the food and um, uh, these nine fish now are large enough, but uh, often the females stop at the first uh, maturation process and they do not go into this phase where um, um, yolk, uh, uh, yolk increase, where the, the eggs really uh, start to, to become mature and um, incorporate a lot of yolk. It's not quite clear um, if it is just the lack in the food composition. These fish are also very sensitive to um, uh, social stress, if there are too many, in, if, you, if you think you have fish over one meter and a half, two meter, you need also the facilities to keep this fish and when may there be stress because there are too many fish together and so on. So it's, this species has not yet been very well understood as far as the whole reproduction cycle is concerned. Uh, and in Germany we still rely on the material from France. You know. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't hear it either. <laughs> uh, the question is how are the waterways restored in some way? Uh, yeah. Dams removed, things like that. Well, in the Elbe River, we um, try to have a look at uh, the old, well known uh, spawning sites. There are a few in the Elbe River left. And um, this may be sufficient if the first fish, which uh, Armitage will come back, well, I don't know, 10 years or so, <laughs> that they will find. But there is a lot of uh, political interest also in restoration of some kind of uh, original spawning sites. Uh, for example, the weir at Gestach, which was uh, originally a, a block for the migration of a large fish has been um, modified. There's a big fish ladder which has been built just because we had so much uh, um, publicity with the sturgeon that they built a large fish ladder which is also uh, capable for the sturgeon to be used and to, uh, to migrate up uh, the river. They may have spawned also in um, Czechoslovakia. Uh, in, in the upper part of the Elbe River. Um, so in the Elbe River, I, I think there may be a chance that there might be um, a natural reproduction sometime. In the Rhine River, where that has been discussed, I think that would be much more difficult for various reasons. So in the moment, we concentrate on the Elbe River. But there are also some small tributaries, which I mentioned, which had been used originally by the sturgeon also as reproduction um, areas, which may, there's also restoration of the, in the rivers going on, so these smaller rivers may be more useful, more easy to be modified and used as uh, future uh, spawning sites for this species. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Frank. And, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much.